So, uh, welcome to today's colloquium. Um, today's speaker is uh, Ruben Essie from uh, Stony Brook University. Um, before talking about uh, Ruben specifically, let me take a step back. Um, about a decade ago was a very interesting transition point as people thought about um, models of dark matter and people started exploring the idea uh, of more interesting dark matter sectors where dark matter had its own properties and interactions and we kind of looked at the properties in the standard model and asked what would happen if those things were present in the uh, dark sector. Um, and it wasn't that people hadn't thought about this, but there was a real change in what people were interested in in the field. Uh, and it was become aware of how little we actually knew about these possibilities. And uh, the reason I bring that up is that it was an exciting time for people to really think about new things. And in particular, we went from a period of knowing very, very little to knowing a tremendous amount. And a lot of that was spearheaded by some incredibly interesting experimental proposals by, at the time, a group of young postdocs, one of whom was Ruben, uh, that really opened the door of ways to look for dark particles that we had not thought about before. And I think it's interesting because, one, it shows how much progress can happen in a short period of time, and also, two, how much can happen with the uh, uh, initiative of young, excited, engaged uh, scientists, because he was not a professor at the time when he started putting all these things together. Uh, and I'm telling you that because he'll probably mention these proposals, but he probably won't tell you how instrumental he was in getting them all started, uh, and how much legwork had to be done, but, but he did. So at any rate, after that point, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of activity in looking for these new ideas of dark matter, and it's really been driven by a, a group of uh, young uh, scientists of whom uh, Ruben is at the forefront, uh, along the way that has caused him to be recognized uh, as uh, by the Prima Career Award, uh, the Prima Early Career uh, Award, and recently also he was named a Sloan Fellow. Uh, he's uh, recently tenured, so he can say whatever he thinks now, and uh, he's going to tell us about a lot of really exciting new ideas for the next decade in looking for dark matter. So. Thank you. So thank you very much. So it's, it's, this is my third visit this year. Before that, I've never visited before. Um, I think maybe one reason was that Neil was actually on my, um, on my thesis defense. I don't know if he remembers this. He was external examiner. And given the performance, it took him, I guess, 10 years or roughly to, to invite me. But uh, so I've been here uh, three times this year, and I'll try to make a habit of that. So um, I'm going to talk about direct detection of subgb dark matter. And this is a topic that I've thought about since 2011, especially with Tom Volansky and Jeremy Martin. Um, but it involves a lot of other people, and I've corrupted enough uh, younger people to think about this as well, and also uh, condensed matter faculty. So there's some nice overlap with condensed matter physics as well, which I'll try to allude to, why that's important for the things I'll, I'll be talking about. Um, and of course, most of the work is being done by the postdocs and students, and I've sort of Everyone in blue here has some Stony Brook affiliation, either in the past or, or currently. And the people that, it, you know, there's a lot of work going on in sort of model building, constraints on light, dark matter, etc. But the people that are most relevant for the work I'll talk about today in terms of dark detection are Tian Tian Yu, postdoc. She's now at CERN, and she's going to be a faculty in Oregon in, in a year from now. And uh, the students, Adrian Soto is a condensed matter theory student from my colleague, uh, Marivi Fernandez Serra at, at Stony Brook. Um, the most exciting thing, and this is one reason why it's sort of exciting to talk about this topic now, is that there are experimentalists thinking about this. So students sort of don't have much of a choice in terms of what they work on, but experimentalists do. It's a significant investment of their time, and I have a lot of experimental collaborators. I'll mention some of this work today. So there's people thinking about uh, one project called Sensei, uh, which I'm very excited about, and I'll tell you about that. There's some other work going on uh, in a little collaboration we're forming called UA Prime One. Um, and then there's work on scintillators, which I won't discuss today, but, but there's some, some interesting work going on. So let me take a step back and start from the beginning. So not the beginning, but a little step back. So we don't understand 85% of the universe's matter. Okay? So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of, the, a lot of stuff that we, is not known. The stuff we do understand is described by the standard model of particle physics, you know, with the quarks and the leptons and the gauge bosons, and most recently the Higgs boson. And this is a wonderful theory, and it describes about 5% of the energy density universe, or 15% of the matter. 
So there's a lot of evidence for new physics, and, and dark matter is, is one of these you know, pillars of, of, of what, what, that we, for which we need new physics. So no standard model particle can be the dark matter. And we want to find out what it is. Okay. Now, um, there's a lot of evidence. And as Neil likes to say, paraphrasing, paraphrasing him or even quoting him, assuming that dark matter exists rather than some modified Newtonian dynamics or so, that's really a conservative assumption. Okay? There's some new particle out there or some set of particles that make up the dark matter. Given the evidence, the dark matter works really well explaining a diverse set of phenomena, which I'm not going to review today, but CMB constraints, a uh, CMB uh, data, there is uh, you know, the Buddha cluster, gravitational lensing, rotation curves, and also just you know, measuring how much mass is in, is in galaxy clusters. So there's a lot of evidence for dark matter. And the question, of course, is that what is it? Okay, so, so uncovering the identity of the dark matter is one of the more, most important goals in particle physics today. And there's a lot of people thinking about it. All the evidence we have for dark matter comes from gravitational interactions. In principle, it doesn't have to interact with standard model particles. That would be unfortunate from, you know, from an experimental point of view or from, a, from you know, my point of view, but that's totally plausible. But we have to, it's so important that we need to sort of explore all possible, all kinds of um, possibilities. So the dark matter landscape, let me talk about this a little bit. So there's some good news. So we know dark matter is roughly between these two mass scales. So this is to orient you a little bit. So this is roughly 10 to minus, well, uh, Zepto EV is 10 to minus 21 EV. That's roughly the lower bound on dark matter. If you want to make dark matter lighter than this, the problem is that it's the Broglie wavelength gets so large that it's larger than the size of a dwarf galaxy. And we know dwarf galaxies exist. And if you want to be able to clump stuff in a dwarf galaxy, you wouldn't be able to do that if you make the mass too light. And on the other end, it's actually also very interesting. So they've been, you of course have all heard about LIGO. So LIGO has seen the merger of black holes. And people have then postulated that maybe they're seeing primordial black holes, which constitute the dark matter merging. And you know, there's a huge range. So this is about 10 to the 60-ish EV. So this is 10 to minus 21 EV. And here, this is not to scale. Okay, I mean, some, some scales are highlighted for a reason, as you see in a second, just to sort of make the plot more visible. But here's the neutrino mass, roughly. Here is the mass of the electron at half an MeV. And here's the mass of the, the top at 172 GV, the heaviest particle in the standard model. Um, so there's lots of possibilities, and the thing that you've probably heard most about is the WIMP, which are great particles, great candidates, weakly interacting massive particles, and I'll define them here to be particles that interact with a standard model weak force, so the W or Z bosons. Okay? Um, those are great candidates. There's a tons of experiments looking for them. I have nothing bad to say about them, um, but there's lots of experimental activity already going on for them. QCD axion is another great candidate. Um, but you know, besides these two, there's really lots of other possibilities. And one of them is, which I'll define here to be ultralight dark matter. So this is bosonic dark matter below a keV. So we know that if the dark matter is below a keV, it has to be a boson, for the same reason that you want to be able to create, you want to be able to form a structure as small as dwarf galaxies. And if it's a fermion, you just can't stuff enough fermions into uh, a dwarf galaxy um, if its mass is below a keV, just from the Pauli exclusion principle. So it's roughly a KV bound. So it's such light dark matter, they're nice candidates, including the QCD axion, scalars, pseudoscalars, vectors, and you've got experts in the audience you know, who have proposed ways to look for this and look for effects on this. Um, on the other end, there is also a hidden sector dark matter, which is sort of a much more general thing which Neil was alluding to. And he, well, to me at least, and I think to many people, he's been very influential in terms of driving the field. When he talks about 10 years ago, there were new ideas. He was largely responsible for them with, with, with his collaborators. And certainly in terms of what I think about and, and kinds of uh, things that motivate me, he's been a uh, big influence. So there's many papers to cite, which I'm not going to do. But this really allows you to expand the mass range of the dark matter much, much more. And the idea is that the dark matter doesn't interact with any of the standard model forces but instead it interacts with some new force. So its own sector, it's in some hidden sector, the dark matter can interact with some new force, like a dark photon or a scalar or something, whatever you want, um, and you have new phenomena. Okay? And that also allows you to go to lighter dark matter masses. Um, there's lots, lots of models, and again, people like Josh and collaborators have been very influential in terms of coming up with new ideas to get the relic abundance for dark matter and uh, figure out you know, what kind of models can exist. 
and they go under the name of you know, hidden thermal relics, Wimpless dark matter, asymmetric dark matter, Friesen, Sims, Elders, Forbidden, Cannibal, etc. So there's really a lot of candidates, and I'm not going to. This is not a talk about models. This is a talk about direct detection techniques. But I just want to mention that there's lots of possibilities, and many of these models are very predictive. They really have sharp targets. So just because, um, yeah, just because it's not a wimp or so, well, even WIMPs are you know, very generic. They're not that predictive either uh, in many cases. But there's many models that, have, that can give very precise targets, which are interesting to, to go after and for which we need new experiments. So up here, for WIMPs especially, there's many experiments. There's the Large Hadron Collider, of course. There's the two flagship experiments in the US, that the Generation 2 direct detection experiments, LZ, which uses xenon, and Super CDMS, which uses silicon and germanium semiconductors. There's the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope looking for indirect detection signals, as well as AMS2. And there's, of course, you know, lots of additional experiments like Xenon 1 ton, Xenon 100, and, and a ton of other uh, direct detection experiments, for example. Um, on the light side, the ultralight side, there's far fewer experiments. But thankfully, thanks in large part to money from private foundations, there's more experiments that are starting to happen with this. Uh, ADMX is an experiment that's funded by uh, U.S. taxpayer, so that's the flagship experiments together with LZ and Super CDMS for looking for axion dark matter. Um, but there's other nice ideas like Casper, etc., that that are coming. But still, the number of experiments is, is far fewer than what exists that go after the WIMP. So there's a vast mass range that remains unexplored, and new small experiments can cover a lot of this new parameter space, at least down to some level. Now, what does this mean? Small scale, I mean order million, you know, less than $10 million. Um, and they can really cover a huge region of the parameter space, which is unexplored right now. And the reason it's unexplored is because often, often you just didn't have the technique or the experimental sensitivity to look for um, these new, new particles. And there was a recent uh, workshop, which I'll just mention, I do think it's going to be, this, this will hopefully have a, some impact on the field in terms of what the DOE and NSF decide to fund in the future. There was a workshop that was requested by the Department of Energy to come up with a science case and also a set of potential experiments that one could do to go after these new, you know, what are the opportunities to look for new dark matter particles besides the WIMP or the, the QCD axion. Um, and lots of ideas were presented, and the basic, I think one of the key features is that you need a comprehensive experimental program that covers a variety of different techniques to try and maximize you know, our discovery opportunity for dark matter, because no single experiment will cover everything. The stuff I'll talk about today, I'm super excited about it, like Sensei, but we need more experiments, more direct detection experiments, and also, as well as other types of experiments like beam dump experiments and uh, you know, new E plus E minus experiments, uh, electron positron colliders. Um, and there's also other techniques that people have talked about. So um, today, I'll focus on the direct detection. So this is sort of a review paper that appeared in July, a white paper with listing of various possibilities. It's already out of date, um, but that, that's great because the field is sort of very active. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about what's been going on, of course, focused from, you know, with a biased perspective in terms of things that I've thought about and which I think are uh, particularly interesting. But the, this talk is going to be discussing sort of a new frontier in direct detection, which is direct detection of dark matter particles with masses between the MEV to GEV range. Okay. So here's the outline for the rest of the talk. So I'll talk about direct detection, what's the concept, what do people usually do, and how can we try to probe sub-GV dark matter. Then I'll tell you about two different approaches, one with xenon. I'll tell you about direct detection constraints down to few MeV masses. And I'll tell you about some new experimental effort to try and uh, improve the existing uh, sensitivities. And then I'll tell you about using a different type of material, semiconductors, in particular silicon. And I'll tell you about the sensor experiment, which um, is really, I think, a big leap forward in this little field, in the subfield of trying to probe, direct, uh, to probe dark matter below the GeV scale. Okay. So let's start with, with this. So the traditional detection concept, what people usually do, uh, which is a great thing, um, like at Lux or Xenon 100, et cetera, what they look, what they do is they take a detector that consists of some material, like Xenon or, or silicon, 
They put it deep in the ground because they want to shield it from cosmic rays. They want to make sure that the, the detector is as quiet as possible. And then they wait. So here I'm showing an atom in that detector. They wait until the dark matter particle in our halo comes by until, uh, and hits the nucleus and gives the nucleus a big kick. And that nucleus will then give you some signal like heat or some light, some scintillation light, or it'll give you some electrons, some charge. And then you try to measure that signal. And um, if you see something and you think it is not caused by some background, by some radioactive background or so, then you're very happy because you might have found dark matter. Um, but this is basically what, what the, the goal is. And there's tons of experiments that do this. And usually what they show is a plot that looks like this. So on the y-axis is the cross-section for dark matter to scatter of nuclei. On the horizontal axis is the dark matter mass, here labeled as WIMP mass, okay? but it could of course be anything. Um, and then they show a plot black curve on this like this. Uh, everything above this black curve is ruled out. Everything below this black curve and to the left is allowed. And the reason this goes up at the bottom, this curve, is that the nuclear recoil energy is too small. So as you lower the dark matter mass, you just cannot give enough kick of a kick to the nucleus to give a signal that you can see. So that's why the curves weaken and more range is allowed at lower masses. And at high masses, you see that the curve is linear, and that's because we know roughly, to work, well, to, you know, certainly better than a factor of two, what the local dark matter density is, but the rate is not proportional to the, the rate is not given by the dark matter density, it's given by the number density of dark matter. The number density of dark matter is going to be given by the energy density over the mass. We know the energy density, it's roughly 0.4 GeV per cubic centimeter. And then as the mass increases, the number of particles that you have decreases, and therefore you know, the chance of something scattering weakens, and then the limit that you can get is weaker. So that just goes, rises linearly. Okay. And then what we have is a tons of experiments, and here I'm just showing the best ones. So here there's a lot of parameter space that was probed by previous generation of experiments up here, but this sort of gives you the outline um, of the different experiments. So at high masses, we've got Xeno 1 ton, they just took enough data to beat the Lux limit and then they publish it. But then of course, much more data is coming. Lux was the previous leader before that. Uh, and at low masses, there is CDMS Light 2 and Crest. And I'll mention another limit in a second that goes you know, it's much higher and, and go to the left here. Okay. But that's what the current constraints are. And then there's projections from various experiments. And I've shown here the two flagship experiments, LZ. So LZ uses five. I think roughly six tons of active xenon. Okay? And at low masses, super CDMS hopes to go to low masses and probe the parameter space. And there's some uh, more futuristic, huge xenon experiment. I forget actually how much, ton, uh, how much material it is, maybe 50 tons or something of xenon, which could try to reach this yellow thing, which is where solar neutrinos become a, a very dominant background. Okay, so solar neutrinos, neutrinos from the sun, can scatter and detect and also give a signal. And at some point, once you read low, low, low enough cross-sections, you really have to worry about them. Okay, so this is basically the WIMP program. It's very active, it's exciting, it's important, right? And nothing that, I've, as I said, nothing that I'm telling, saying here is meant to you know, say it's not, not an important thing. But I do say, what I do want to say is that we need to expand the searches, the type of searches we're doing. So the question is, can we go to lower masses? Can we really probe down below this GeV scale? So here's the GeV. And the conventional wisdom is that there is just no sensitivity to dark matter with mass less than a GeV. And the answer, though, is that there is. We can. In fact, there have already existed direct detection constraints down to few MeV for several years. Okay? I'll show you. I'll review those today. They go down to 5 MeV. There are significant improvements we can expect over the next two to three years. And when I used to give this talk a few months ago, I would phrase it slightly differently. You know, I would say significant improvements are possible in the next few years. Now I'm actually very confident that they will be possible due many to one experiment called Sensei. The Sensei experiment, there's no exclamation mark in the name, but I'm just excited about it, so that's why I put it there. But um, there's really going to be a huge amount of parameter space that's going to be probed, and I'll tell you about it. Okay. And we can probe many dark matter candidates. You know, I've listed some of them, not explained them, but I've listed some of them earlier. Okay. So let's talk about how we can do this. So again, the main reason, so the, main, the one, one important thing is that we cannot use nuclear recoils to try and look for this. If you've got 
a light dark matter particle hitting a nucleus is just not going to give enough energy transfer to that nucleus. So you just can't see it. Okay, so we need to use something else. And just getting back to what I said earlier, there is so the best current limit that goes to the lowest masses, at least as far as I know, comes from Crest. So this is the nucleus, uh, dark matter scattering of nucleon, nucleon cross section as a function of the dark matter mass. This is 100 MeV. So this is about 140 MeV here. And look, the cross section is 10 to the 4 picobon. So that's 10 to the minus 32 centimeters squared. And on our previous plot that I had, it's sitting way up here. So it's a very weak limit. It's a great result. This can actually just came out in July, um, but it's not a you know, very strong constraint yet. Okay. They actually used half a gram of sapphire uh, coupled to some transition net sensor, which uh, they're able to measure very low energy depositions. Okay. So that, that was a sort of a nice result, but it's still a very weak limit. So can we do better? And the answer is yes, we can. And one way to do this is to consider that dark matter doesn't scatter of the nucleus, nucleus, but that the dark matter scatters of electrons. Okay, so very simple idea. And the idea is that as you have, just, just as you have nuclei, you of course have electrons in your detector material that you put you know, underground. And it's much easier to scatter of an electron and give enough energy to the electron to, for example, ionize the atom. So the dark matter come in, hit the electron, and ionize an atom. Or, as I'll talk about more in a second, you can imagine that you've got some semiconductor material which has a valence band and a conduction band with a little bang gap in between, and you can kick the electron from the valence band to the conduction band. And the signal that you would get is one or a few electrons. It could also be that you, for example, excite the atom to some higher state. So you excite the electron into some higher energy state. It de-excites and then gives a photon. So you might also be able to look for photons. Today I'm going to focus on looking for electrons for this talk. Okay. So let's first do some simple kinematics and ask what kind of materials we want to look at for dark matter scattering of electrons. So what kind of mass range could we potentially probe? So the electron is in some bound state. So it has some binding energy. Let's call that binding energy delta E. At the very least, what I need is that the dark matter kinetic energy, half mv squared, is bigger than that binding energy. So that I can transfer the energy to the electron and um, ionize the atom, for example. Now, the dark matter kinetic energy is, not, is bounded. So if I fix the mass, then the velocity, since the velocity is also fixed to be less than the escape velocity, about 600 kilometers per second in our halo, the velocity of the dark matter, yes, yeah, so since that uh, has an upper bound, the dark matter kinetic energy is bounded above. And the lowest mass I can probe is 300 keV for a binding energy of one electron volt. So if I can see, if I have a system with a binding energy of one electron volt, then I can principle probe down to dark, for dark matter masses down to 300 keV. If I've got a system of 10 electron volts, then it's 3 MeV, very roughly. Now, I'll just state this here, and you'll see this diagrammatically later. It's, it's not that hard to explain, but I'm not going to actually do it. There is actually a typical recoil energy for the electron that you can work out. Okay? And that's just a few electron volts. So the signal that you really want to look for is a few electron volts. It could be large as well, but it's suppressed by some form factor. But the typical recoil energy of the electron is a few electron volts. But what kind of materials do we want to look at now? So what are the possible target materials for electron recoils? And there's many things that people have thought about. I will focus on two. So one material that people really like to use is, of course, xenon, as I already mentioned. So noble liquid, some noble liquid. Could also be argon or helium, but xenon is used at the moment much more. There's also an experiment that uses argon, and there's R&D going on using helium for it to, to use helium, but xenon is, is one of the dominant materials. Now, xenon is a big atom, but if I consider the electron in the outermost shell, the binding energy of that electron is about 10 electron volts, just like the hydrogen atom. It's 13.6 electron volts. If you've got a big atom, the outermost electron is roughly of the same order, so 10 electron volts, very roughly. For xenon in particular, it's 12.4. For helium, it's a bit larger, but it's roughly that order. So I can get down to a few MeV using this previous formula. Okay. So I put a 10 electron volt here. Another very good material to use are semiconductors. They're again used by many different experiments. Super CDMS uses them, Damag uses them. Um, 
And a semiconductor, it's like germanium or silicon, the idea is that there is a valence band, which is filled. Then there's a little gap, energy gap. So this is a function, uh, the, you know, the axis of energy goes up here. And then there's a conduction band, and you can conduct a current, you can conduct charge, if you put the electron from the valence band, if you put some electrons from the valence band into the conduction band, then you can conduct the charge. So the band gap of this material, of a material, depends of course exactly what it is, but is roughly one electron volt. Okay. Now there's many other ideas out there which I'm not gonna discuss today, but people have used, talked about using gallium arsenide, so a scintillator, which, uh, which has a band gap of 1.5 electron volts, for example. People have talked about using graphene, two-dimensional sheets of graphene. For example, the Ptolemy 3G, um, or G3, whatever it's called, uh, the experiment wants to use um, sheets of graphene, and uh, that's, that's a very interesting idea as well. People have talked about using superfluid helium, and even superconductors where the binding energy of a Cooper pair is milliEV, and you can imagine probing down to kV masses if you can see a signal. So the status of these things are that we have a limit for subsidiary dark matter from Xenon 10 data as well as Xenon 100 data. And there's a new proposal called the UA Prime 1 experiment for it, for, so for, for, to improve the existing limits. And for semiconductors, there's a funded experiment called Sensei, which has a threshold not at the band gap of silicon, but a little bit higher, about five electron volts. Okay. And if there's time, I'll explain why it's five and not, not, one, not um, at the band gap exactly. Um, and then there's tons of ideas out there, which are in this white paper that I mentioned earlier, and there's R&D required to try and uh, get these ideas to fruition, but I'm pretty sure many of these ideas will come to fruition. Okay, there's lots of interesting work going on. And sort of an interesting thing is that, so for myself, so I'm a particle theorist, but for these type of, uh, for this particular topic, I talk a lot to condensed matter theorists. Okay, one of the important collaborators is a condensed matter theorist and her student. Okay. Um, in terms of, of this, and I'll allude to that as we go through. And of course, you need to talk to experimentalists and instrumentalists who can actually build something, and you, know, and you have to figure out what can you do, what kind of, um, what, what, what's actually feasible, just to keep you on the real axis. Okay. So, that's the direct detection concept. Maybe I'll just pause for a second and ask if there's any questions. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so if they, what they're actually talking about is extracting the electron, and the work function of the material is about five electron volts. So the gap, in some sense, is five electron volts. Yeah, yeah in that case. Right. Yeah, in that case, it's different. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Quick questions. Yeah. So it's right now unspecified, but you can imagine some scalar or some dark photon that allows the dark matter to interact with with the electron. But the dark matter is not electrically charged, so it does not interact directly with a photon, right? So I'm not imagining some milli charged. Yeah. So it's some new particle that's neutral under the standard model forces, but it interacts with some hidden U1, some dark U1. It's charged with some dark U1, which is broken, and then I can get a connect, connect mixing between the dark U1 and the and the hypercharge and get um, the vector portal, like a mixing between, get a dark photon. So we can talk about that more afterwards, but yeah, there's ways to, ways to do that. But right now, I don't really care in terms of the phenomenology. Okay. Okay, okay good. So uh, let me tell you about the xenon constraints and how one could potentially improve them. So xenon 10, um, I'll talk about xenon 10, focus it, and just show what the xenon 100 constraint is. So xenon 10 is an experiment that ran about 10 years ago. Okay, it was the first prototype uh, for the xenon experiments, and then, you know, we had two collaborations emerge from that, Xenon 100, Xenon 1 ton, Xenon N ton eventually, Lux and LZ on the other side. So the basic idea of how the detector works is as follows. So this experiment ran 10 years ago, but it was sensitive for a few days. They took data that were, which allowed them to be sensitive to single electrons. The idea is the following. So here's the schematic of the detector. So here's liquid, Xenon liquid. That's the target material. There's Xenon gas on top. And then they have photomultiplier tubes on the top and the bottom, which detect light. And in addition, there's an electric field across the material. So if now dark matter comes in and hits, um, I want my dark matter to come in and hit an electron. So my dark matter comes in, hits an electron, and ionizes an atom. 
It could be that that electron has enough kinetic energy, enough recoil energy, that it might ionize other atoms. So I might get one electron, sometimes two, so maybe sometimes three, and with a suppressed probability, you know, four, five, etc. Okay, but I can get a few electrons out. Those electrons, because of the electric field, will drift up. They'll cross this liquid gas interface. In that gas phase, there's actually even a larger electric field. The electrons bounce around against the xenon atoms, will create scintillation light, and that scintillation light will be detected by the photomultipliers. Each electron produces about 27, on average, 27 detected photons. It's a huge signal. Okay? This is not some difficult signal for them to see. Okay? So they were sensitive to single electron interactions, where they could see single electrons. So they took data for a few days, 15 kilogram day exposure, not much data, and they saw a lot of events, a few hundred events, single electrons. So here is the number of events per photoelectron. So it's, at the bottom here is the photoelectrons that they see. Remember that for each 27, for each electron they get about 27 photoelectrons. So on the top axis is the number of electrons. This corresponds to 27. Two is two times 27, uh, so 54, etc. And what you see in this orangey curve in the back, that's the data they saw. So you see a huge single electron peak. There's some evidence for a two electron peak. And then there's these dribble of events out here as well. Okay. Now, we don't know what these events are. There are hypotheses of what these events could be. One hypothesis is that you, in this detector, you always have some background going on. So there's gamma rays, radioactive decays in the surrounding material, etc. There, there might be some big gamma ray that comes in, creates a big mess in the detector, creates tons of electrons. Those electrons will get drifted up. And then sometimes, most of them will just go through, give some signal. It's a huge signal. We don't care about it. But sometimes those electrons can get stuck at the liquid gas interface and they dribble out a few hundred milliseconds later, and it looks like a single electron event. That's a background, and it's difficult to deal with it, but um, it's, it's sort of an annoying background. But it's a detector-specific background for these xenon experiments. There is no background model for it, but what we can assume is that, let's be very conservative, we want to take this data, set a limit on dark matter scattering with electrons, uh, we can calculate what that is. So here's a 30 MeV dark matter particle, that's the signal it would give. Here's a 100 MeV dark matter particle, that's the signal it would give. Um, and we can just constrain, use that data and pretend all of it is dark matter or potentially dark matter to set a very conservative constraint on the cross section. And you can do that. Um, and what you get is this plot, where now I'm plotting the dark matter scattering of electron cross section, sigma E. I'm plotting the dark matter mass down on the x axis here. And I get a constraint where everything shaded is ruled out. So everything above this is ruled out. So the shape is sort of similar, okay, as we had for the usual plot. And notice, though, that now we're talking about MeV masses. So this is a constraint that goes down to few MeV masses. So this is a real direct detection constraint down to few MeV masses, okay. And, and this is something that, that existed for a few years already, okay. <clears throat> Xeno 100 is the one other experiment <clears throat> that has released data. And they didn't go down to single electrons. They just went down to four electrons. So they didn't, don't have, I need to have a heavier dark matter particle to set a limit. So that's the Xeno 100 limit, which doesn't go quite as low. And just by pure coincidence, the rate of background events they see just happens to be the same. So they've got 30 kilogram year exposure versus 15 kilogram days. It's a much bigger experiment, ran for much longer. But they see so many background events that they But this is a theory where it needs to happen. For example, 
one can try to use an anti-matter techniques like kind of energy density quantum theory, and when I have dynamic simulations, we try to understand how energy can behave in xenon liquid, try to calculate the abstract of xenon, and try to understand some of the background. So there's sort of an effort going on in that direction. And maybe in a few years' time, we'll have an experiment that has far reaching background. So, any quick question on that? Okay. I'm confused about what you said before that an electron may interact with the submark material without photo. This would mean that an electron, in addition to having an electric charge, also has a dark charge. In this case, an electron is also an emitter of dark photons. My question is have you ever observed emission of dark photons by a described by a shortage of photons, where this is where an electron loses energy, but we don't see any photons coming out. So, um, no, I don't know, that, I don't think that's been observed, but you're right that I can, there's many different ways that produce a dark photon, correctly. Right? Um, and there's been no experiments, etc. what you do to look for that. And plus your minus for light, etc. for that. And there's a number of constraints which I can tell you about, um, and, uh, but, but not now. That's a good question. But it doesn't, there's still a lot of overrun space, so I can still have a dark enough to have a dark photon. And it's not all that way. But there are constraints, so. Okay. okay, so let me talk about the last topic, something that happens. So I'm taking a look at it towards sensing. So again, the idea is that there is some maintenance man and a construction man with a little band gap. So here, this is exactly band labs with the name silica. 0.67 EV and 1.1 EV. We'll really focus on silica. The 1.1 EV. And the idea is that you have some medical sitting around and you can make a maintenance plan. The doctor comes in, hits it, it's an excited production man, and what you then have is an electron somewhere high in the production band, and the thing that remains is a hole. Basically, a positive charge. Now, these electrons and holes, they won't just sit around. If it gets its energy gets excited very high in the conduction band, it's going to fall down again. And it turns out that for each 3.6 EV of recon energy in silica, you're going to get an additional electron all day. So if I've got band gap 1.1 plus 3.6 EV of energy recon energy, I'm going to get two electron things. I've got 1.1 EV band gap plus 2 times 3.6, and I'm going to get three electron things. So what I get is some number of electrons and holes um, in the base in the production band and the base band okay. And then those electrons can be lifted and those holes can be lifted. Now, to calculate this, I just want to say it's not that trivial. Okay. So the electron is part of a many body attacking system. So what you do as a particle theorist like myself, you go to your condensed matter body and to ask them, can you give me the wave functions, can you calculate the wave function of the band structure of silicon, and there's of course techniques. They know how to do this much better than we do, and there's a program and some of you know it called Fun Espresso, which we adapted to calculate these rates, and now the rate calculation has been made so much easier. And the people, you know, Chenja and you, my former host, talk about post of concern, and I've got sort of the best of the theories to have done a lot of work to try and make this useful for experiments. But we know now what the rates are, and here is a spectrum for a dark matter particle. As a function of the recoil energy. So here's the rate for the over here for some particular cross section. Doesn't matter what cross section, we care about the shape of the exact numbers. There are two dark matter masses that are plotted, 10 MeV and 1 MeV, blue, black, respectively. And I'm making this as a function of the electron recoil energy, or given that each 3.6 MeV of electron recoil energy gives me additional electron pair. I can put the number of electron pairs that I've created at the bottom. Okay, so you see there's a lot more correspondence. So here's what the spectrum looks like. It's focused on the 10 EV. It drops rapidly. So we get a little peak at a few EV, but then it drops very rapidly. So we get a little peak at two electron pairs, and then it drops rapidly. And you can see that if you sit out here, if your experiments are only able to measure 10 electron pairs to drop it, the rate is going to be many, many orders of magnitude lower than what it would be able to measure, for example, two electron pairs. So it's very sharp to use. 
So how do we detect these electrons? And there's basically two ways that experiments are trying to detect. One approach is from super CDMS. So what they have here, they've got some material, this is schematic, they've got some material of silicon, which are they here. They apply an electric field across that material. We create the electron with the holes. Because of the electric field, they will start to drift. And they will interact with the lattice. They'll create vibrations, phonons. They'll create heat. And those phonons that get created as the electron hole gets drift get detected by phonon detectors. And they've managed to achieve a threshold of about 40 electron volts. So let's go back to our red plot. 40 electron volts is off to the right of this plot. So we're sitting at 11 electron volts. Yeah, they're sitting up here. They have to see everything to the right, but nothing to the left. So if we have a one for dark matter, it might be there, it might be doing something, but we're just not seeing it. All is very dangerous. The second approach is to use silicon, the second approach we've try is to use silicon CCDs. So here's a CCD. It consists of about a million pixels. Here's a picture of the CCD with each of these is a pixel. This is focused on one pixel. In that pixel, I've got my silicon. And here's the, and again, the schematic dark light comes in. It's an electron from the Venus conduction lab, creates some charge, maybe one, two, three electrons. And then you can have, then you've got some charge sitting at these um, pixels, the inner pixel. And then what you do is you read out this charge by moving to charge one pixel to the next. And in one of these corners, or usually in all four corners, you put a readout stage, that you will read out uh, where you try to the charge. So there's electrons, each pixel gets moved along until it gets to one of these output stages, and then it gets measured. <coughs> and Damic has used these CCDs, so Damic has for dark matter and CCDs, and this is the that they've used so far as a readout noise. So when you make a measurement of the charge of the pixel, there is an error, and the way and the error is roughly two electrons are immense. So you're uncertain by two electrons what you measure. If you have many pixels, the chance that you sometimes measure 10 electrons, even if there's nothing in the pixel, is pretty large. Okay. Um, so this basically leads to a high threshold as well. Because we need to be several sigma above this noise, maybe five sigma can save. So your threshold is again about 10 to electrons, and it's very high for 40 electrons. And again, we're sitting at this side here. And the best limit, given that the expected rates are so tiny, the best limit from dark matter scattering electrons from a CCD, from, from silicon, from semiconductor, was done by Damic using 107 grams of day, gram in day. So we calculated this limit a few years ago, and it's much, much worse. Everything about the screen line and the screen shape region is <coughs> constrained based on this old data, which had a threshold of just off of 11 electrons. And it's much worse even than the other. So clearly, if we can lower the threshold, we can do much, much better. We can access so much more of with the dominant darkness. And this was recently achieved in what I think is sort of a big breakthrough for this field for the research today. And the experiment, <coughs> the, yeah, the experiment that has achieved this is called Sensei. So Sensei stands for sub-electron noise. So if you want the noise not to be two electrons, but want to be tiny, so sub-electron. Skipper CCD, so skipper CCD is also the special CCDs, which I'll talk about in a little second. And experiments. Um, this started as a lab <coughs> program a few years ago, 2016. Harry Tittenberg, who uh, I think technically is still a postdoc, but hopefully he'll be a postdoc time soon after we have, was the PI for this. There are people, Chris Bennett and Steve Hollins, who helped with the design of the CCDs, and he was a postdoc, um, and this is a suit. And then there's a bunch of theorists um, who watch the experiment. Okay. So, so this is a lab-directed research program which we started a few years ago, 
and uses skip as CCDs. So this is a CCD which was developed by LBML Microsystems Lab. The particular CC that was used it has about a million pixels and then more. So it's an array of 4,126, like an 866 array of pixels whose size is 50 micrometers squared. The thickness is 250 micrometers. So these are like big towers of CCDs. They're tiny CCDs with a lot of mass, basically. You want to make them thick as much mass as possible. Um, and the skip of CCD, what it allows you to do is basically <coughs> measure the same pixel of charge in a non-destructive way so that you can repeat the measurement many, many times and then average and be noise. So you take a CCD pixel, you measure the sample, and you measure it again, and again, and again, that averages down the noise, and the final pixel value is what they're going to take, it's just the mean of all your measurements. And that allows you to achieve a RMS noise for two electrons, it's 0 0.068. And that allows you to have a dramatic reduction So the main difference, so the, the nice thing about this is that there's no real difference in the CCD, in the vast majority of the CCD. It's really just the readout. And here's the diagram of the readout stage, which I'm not going to discuss. Instead, I'm going to simplify it super massively and just schematically tell you how this works. <coughs> so here's a CCD with lots of pixels. I move my charge all the way to the edge where there's a readout stage. There's a little voltage that you want to read out as the charge gets moved. So Capacitor, etc. And as the charge gets moved, we measure voltage and then make a measurement. Um, then zoom in on this. <coughs> See what the voltage does as a function of time. So here's zero. So you've got some electrons that you move here. You move them over, you measure some voltage, you move them back, it goes back to zero, and you just repeat this back and forth. And you can repeat this a thousand times, four thousand times, depending on what that you want. Um, very simple concept. It's only now, this idea has been around for a while, I think 30 or 40 years, but it's only been demonstrated now uh, with, with highly technical uh, experimenters, you know, Bay and uh, the lead world. Now, this measurement, moving back and forth once, takes 10 microseconds. It's very quick. So if you want to measure the charge a thousand times, it takes 10 milliseconds. So it's true that you have to read out and pixel, the CCD with a million pixels, it's going to take more an hour to read out. So this is not like you just, it's, it's an instantaneous measure, it takes a lot to read out. And this is data, this is what you get. So let's take, this is taking each pixel, measuring it 4,000 times, and then plotting the average. And what you see is, so this is a charge, this is the number of pixels. And what you see is that here are pixels with zero electrons. This causes a little bit of noise, but it's tiny. That's why it gets into red. Here are pixels with one electron, here are pixels with two electrons. But I'm not confusing what zero, what's one, what's two. And this goes even out to much, much higher charge. So 1550, 1551, two, you can really measure the charge of the pixel precisely. Okay. So, and the noise just basically goes down as well. One minute. So if it takes an hour to read out, what is the sort of notion of an exposure time before that? I mean, you're collecting the charge and then for some amount of time when you read it out. So. I mean, basically you can just read it out continuously. I mean, you just, you can just, yeah, basically read it out. I mean, as a system, you don't know where the charge is positive. Yes, yeah, so you don't know. Yeah, you just go through that, 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 that sounds like it. I mean, are you expecting that, that it happens somewhere, like your interaction happens somewhere in the middle of the hour read out? Right, so you want to know exactly when, when it happens and what you pixel. Um, yeah, so there's some concern. So now what we've done is we formed a little collaboration called the Sensing Collaboration, whose goal is to look for light dark matter, both ultralight and the insect of dark matter. And right now, it's a very small collaboration that's more to come. Uh, there's three theorists, so you can't send experimental collaboration with three theorists, of course. I just to know this is the main guy on the front side. Uh, there's students and there's more um, postdocs, etc. Uh, we already have 0.2 grams underground in the Minos hole, which may produce a science result that's not visible, but we're not sure yet. So this CCD that we have, this CCD we have, was produced not in a dedicated run to produce them, but in a parasitic run. 
and they manipulated the CCDs afterwards, and basically they've got some uh, reflective coding on them that they put on, and that might contain some radioactive material, we don't know. So it might be that we're just going to respond with some radioactive background. But we don't know. If not, then we can actually set it on to those kinds of problems. So this thing is running in the Venus Hall, so here's the Fermilab, the building, high rise, 100 meters on the ground, it's the Venus Hall, there is a little, uh, so here's Nova, and there's a little hallway, and there's a little tent, um, which, so I managed to visit that. So as viewers, I get very excited when I get to wear a new hat. But it's basically a little clean tent, that's how we took them over here. Um, and inside, there is a little uh, vessel, which is nice and cold, but under Kelvin, but the normal under Kelvin. You see all the electronics going here, um, and there's a little pointing grass and stuff. Now, the goal is to you know, do something much better, and we recently received support both from Fermilab, so Fermilab is supporting it, and also also on the other ground from Heisen Science Foundation to build a 100 gram experiment. And with that, what we plan to do is take, uh, do some stages, go through and do 10 gram experiments to make sure everything works, and then 100 gram experiments after that. We want to take data in about one year with a 10 gram experiment. That can be done in Minos. Minos, 100 meters on the ground, is enough to do that. And then in two years, we can do 100 gram experiments. Uh, that needs to be deeper, possibly at the sample of the underground research center. That's so. Um, so, okay, so let me talk about that one a little bit. Because okay, that's the thing which is always a big worry if you guys do is like, okay, what are the backgrounds? So, you might worry that they're bad, right? So you have all energies, anything you must give this kind of thing. Now it turns out that they're not important. So first of all, we don't know it. The ability to do the measurement accurately, that's the bottom of any level of control. The solar neutrinos, they are not a background if you're exposed or less than a kilogram again. So if we go to higher mass materials and run them long enough and get exposed to a kilogram again, you will see some solar neutrinos. But for 100 grand a year, you don't worry about it. Radio energy backgrounds, so Compton, and EWK, etc., those we expect to be less important than for 100 grand a year. So here is the spectrum again number of events, this function of the charge. This is actually chosen to be a particular model, okay, so that's the sort of interesting little benchmark model. Here's the document of signal, function of the charge. You see again this huge rise as you go with thresholds. So the previous experiments were sitting here. Now we're going to go get it to a much lower. Um, and here's the common background. So it's flat. Why is it flat? Well, most beta decays or radio decays, the typical energy of these events is clean in scale. Okay? And of course, you've got a tail down to the lowest energies. But with the shielding that's already been achieved in the previous generation, in previous experiments like that, um, basically, you can shield the thing well enough that by the time you're sitting at the very low energy tail of this background, it's not a big deal. So you see about 0.1 events a bit. So you can take a few bins and have you know, almost basically a background frequency. The one thing you have to worry about a little bit are dark counts. So this sitting in the skipper city is sitting at about 100 color. So random fluctuations from temperature thermal fluctuations can sometimes excite an electron from the bed into the conduction map. And that actually turns out will happen a lot in a 100 gram day exposure for one electron. So the chance that one electron gets excited up is very high, so we cannot set a threshold for one electron. <coughs> However, you can ask what's probably that the two electrons are going to get excited up in the same uh, pixel. And that chance is very good to make and with the current measured up the middle of the dark count on the dark current that was done dynamic, we know already that for sure we can use the free electron threshold. Well, for sure, probably not. Uh, but the expectation that we can actually use the free electron threshold. Okay. So that means that we don't get to use that first bit here, but we get to see all these other things. So, to end, the last five minutes. So what models can we build? Okay, I'm just going to show some propaganda plots, so I'm not going to explain models in detail. But uh, very simply, the idea is the following. You can make predictive models. 
So, for example, with the dark moment that I mentioned earlier, you can calculate what the radical balance is of dark matter. And if you've got some light dark photons sitting around, you can calculate what the annihilation rate is of dark matter to stand around the particles through some dark photons. And you can fix that annihilation cross section because we know what the radical balance is. We know what number we need to get. We know what cross section we need to get. And then we can turn the diagram around and calculate the dark section rate. And we know what the number is. And there's many variations on this, but basically what we get is a plot like this, where the following is happening. So this goes to the distance. Here is sigma e bar again, cross section, dark mass goes in. Here's the dark <coughs> mass from MAB to your GED. Here are the xenon 10 and xenon 100 units in blue. Here are the sensor reaches 10 gram, 1 month, 100 gram, 1 month, 100 gram, 1 year. That's the natural goal. Everything in gray is a constraint from you know, some of the things you were mentioning uh, in producing dark matter at deep dark experiments or producing dark matter at deep plus or minus the light at the particular model. So everything gray is ruled out. But everything in shade is a particular model which can be written down, which is sort of predictive. And here is the most scalar, exponential fermion, or simple and helpful. Some of the word buzzers that I mentioned earlier. It's not explaining them at all. But there's a lot of parameter space, motivated parameter space, what you call parameter space, that can be controlled by a new experimental parameter test. And you can see that this is 10, 10, 10, 10 gram one month, and that's not much time that you really had to some of these models. Then the next program is the following. This is a different kind of model where I have a very tiny <coughs> mediator that does the mediation of the dark matter to actually start the model. Now you know that if you have a light mediator, that the cross-section is really going to go as one of the momentum transfers of the ball. The mass of the mediator is one of the forces that very light middle dimension. Mm -hmm. So here's a model where the cross-section goes as one of the mediator of momentum transfers of the ball. So if I'm sensitive to low momentum transfers, I'm going to get a huge increase in the cross-section. And sensor is sensitive to low momentum transfers, okay? where, where you just get a little bit of like two electrons in the objectives. And here are the xenon 10 and xenon 100 limits that we've written out, different kind of model. The xenon 10 dominates the power. There's the traditional direct detection searches up here, and there's some supernova media in the and that's not here. And what you see is that running sensei, the 10 gram experiment for three hours already beats the xenon 10 limit. That's just because we're sensitive to much lower momentum transfers than xenon 10. In a few minutes, we'll already get broken parameter space, and that's all we down here. In three hours, we get this. And it's a particular model for freezing dark matter, which uh, you want to line on this line, this, this part. Yeah. You can get the right leg marks along this line. In one month, we probe it with sensor 10, sensor 100, one month, and sensor 100. Yeah. And this little 0.2 gram experiment we've got going on now, assuming the radioactivity, the assuming the radioactivity, you don't know yet. But if it works, this 0.2 gram experiment is proven on the xenon 10 limit in this model that I'm not quite sure if I mentioned tiny mass, but it can actually prove on things. And there's many other models. So here, dark matter can also be absorbed by an electron in the signal. Um, but there's lots of other ideas that are out there. I just mentioned a tiny fraction of the ideas of both the silicon and the local liquids. Many ideas are out there. Uh, some from the people in this room as well. So it's using superconductors, molecules, uh, scintillators, two-dimensional targets like graphene, and getting bubble chambers, and helium, and the lumbering, et cetera. And there's a summary if you're interested in this paper. And as I said, it's really a little bit updated, but it's not too bad. Yeah. And then, you know, Sensei is sort of leading the pack in terms of what people are trying to do now, but there's a lot of R&D going on to try to improve it, and I'm certainly, you know, I'm pretty confident that there will be lots of other things that get turned into reality and uh, we're going to make a lot of progress. So here, for example, it's the same plot that has zoomed out. So here's the Sensei 100 gram experiment. Lots of ideas to go beyond that. The old dash dot lines because either not funded or they make some assumptions about what the kind of reaches the point people back into the um, But you can see there's lots of activity going on in the community. So to summarize, I think the, so the goal, right, is to uncover that energy of dark matter. There's no guarantee at all that we're going to do that. We might not be able to figure out what dark matter is. We 
hoping that it has some standalone interactions. And if it does, and there's certainly good reason why we think about it, um, if, and that protection we're going to talk about today is possible down to any of the masses, and possibly much lower, you know, given if the RNA works out, but certainly down to any of the masses. And zero experiments have demonstrated sensitivity. It's not great, but there's clear the ideas to try to prove it. I talked about this later in my attempt. And then Sensei um, will probe high probability whilst we can move around the space so we to go well in the next few years. But again, you're coming back to this emphasis that I had earlier that we really need to rent a program of not just our detection experiments, not just different things that we're talking about today, but also you know, other types of experiments to try and maximize uh, the chance of discovery of the Continue our discussion through the process tree on the floor. 10th floor. 